Introduction to Amino Acids, Peptides, and Proteins. Yay! <laughs> I know, it's bio. Now it all makes sense. All right. Introduction to Amino Acids. So amino acids are pretty simple. So when we draw an amino acid, we usually draw it with an R group like that. We call these alpha amino acids. Why do we call them alpha amino acids? Exactly, so it's not a beta amino acid. That amino group's coming off the alpha position, so it's alpha amino, indicating that alpha position is, uh, the, excuse me, the amine is separated one carbon away from the carboxylic acid. Why are these important? So we're, we're looking at the alpha to the amine or to the carboxylic Well, just why are amino acids in general important? No, I'm just asking about the alpha. Yeah. Yes, proteins. Yes, the alpha position is one carbon away from the carbonyl. Yes, Adrian. Okay, thank you, Ian. All right. so let's draw a short peptide unit here. This is it. So we've got an R group here. We've got an R group here. We've got an R group here. Essentially, a peptide is just repeating units. Whoop, oh, no. And what we call these are peptide bonds. It's a bond between two separate amino acids or even two of the same amino acids in order to form a polymer. And so we call this a protein, or some people call it a polypeptide. It depends on who's teaching the course. What's that? Uh, I'm just showing three arrows because you can repeat it. We'll talk about how to make these, though. The, the, it's not as simple as you would think to form a polypeptide. Our body's excellent at it. Synthetic chemists are not so great at it. Um, we have very elaborate techniques to make peptides. All right, so one thing I did post on the class website is another chart you have to remember. All right, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So... If you go on and you take biochem, your instructor may ask you to memorize all of these. Because we only have a week left in this term, I'm not going to ask you guys to memorize these. But this is a fantastic chart. I put a PDF link of it online. I didn't print it out because our color printer died downstairs. I'll try to get copies to you guys next Monday, though. Um, the best part about this is that it not only shows the 20 main amino acids, but it also kind of divides them up into groups, and we'll talk a little bit more about these, but there are some amino acids that are more acidic than others, there are some that are more basic than one another, um, there are some that have aromatic groups, some that have aliphatic groups, so you can kind of break them apart using this visual chart. So it's a really nice tool to use. Um, honestly, the 20 here are only some of the amino acids out there. These are the 20 natural amino acids in humans, um, there's actually a few derivatives of them, too, where you've got um, selenium in there instead of sulfur, and those are some other fancy ones. And then plants make a bunch of goofy ones, too, that don't tend to fit into this chart. So this is just uh, the most common ones in humans. So if you're taking biochemistry, these are the ones you'll see. What does aliphatic mean? Aliphatic just means uh, alkane chain on there. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's draw some amino acids. So amino acids can be drawn with a Fischer projection. Okay. 
So just like with sugars, we can draw these out. So I'm going to draw a couple of them. So I'll have a methyl group down here. So CH2OH. Sorry, let me finish drawing all of these and then we'll talk about them. So we've got HOH. H, O, H. And what we have going left to right is we've got alanine. We've got serine. And we've got valine. All right, so just like with Fisher representations, remember the back bones are pointing back? Yeah, it's the cat on its back with the arms pointing forward. If we were classifying these D or L, what would these be classified as? L. L. So normally sugars, we have a hydroxyl group on the right side. D or L. So you remember with sugars, we said that D sugars always have the hydroxyl group over here. But with <laughs> amino acids, these hydroxyl groups are actually on the opposite side. So we always call these L sugars, or sorry, L amino acids. And that refers to the left side of each of these. Does it have anything to do with chirality? Yes. Not exactly, because the identity of the R group could change the RRS. And that's one big misconception a lot of people have, is they'll say amino acids all have the same stereochemistry. Not true. Amino acids are all L, but they don't necessarily have the same stereochemistry. The identity of the R group can change that from an R to an S stereocenter. So you do have to be careful with that. All right, I've got an interesting article. It's, a little, it's not, these aren't hallucinogenic mushrooms. So I was reading about this, you guys. So in China, they had this problem with people going out picking mushrooms and then hurling over dead. And they couldn't figure out what it was in these mushrooms that were killing them. And oftentimes, natural product scientists, whenever they find a toxic compound, they want to know what it is because that compound might have some therapeutic uses in low doses. So in this case, they went out and they searched for these mushrooms in China, and they found them. Um, they killed 260 people. Pretty incredible. And so they kept on trying to figure out what is it in these that are killing them. And they found these sh uh, amino acids in there. So you can see they're all alpha amino acids, and then you've got a guanidine unit on the right-hand side. But the problem with these is that these are... D amino acids. So they're not they're the correct um, type of amino acid that our body is used to dealing with. So what do you think happens when these get introduced into our body? You die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so your proteins fold in a really, really specific manner. If you put in an opposite-handed mimic to one of your amino acids, it's going to kink up all of your proteins. So these are some of the most toxic compounds known to man, just simply because they're the wrong type of amino acid. And so you do have to be careful. Um, the syntheses that I'll show you for making amino acids are racemic. Um, oftentimes, you have to be very, very careful purifying these to make sure that there's no trace amount of the D amino acid left over, or else you could end up killing people. Um, there's a lot of advanced techniques to avoid D, D amino acids. Why do people keep eating out of people who are dying? Well, honestly, people do that here, too. They don't know what they're picking. So it's just mushroom identification. So if you do want to read about this, too, I put the link on here. It's kind of interesting. All right, acid-base chemistry, you guys. We're going back to the basics. So let's say we've got an amino acid here. And we put this into our body. So 
So our body has a very tightly controlled pH system. Do you think it's going to look like the amino acid drawn on the left? So will it look like the representation of the amino acid that I've drawn? No. Yeah, we've got an acid here, and we've got a base there. So we're going to do a proton transfer. So you mostly end up with your protonated amine whoops, and your carboxylate salt. What do we call it when you've got a positive and negative charge on the same molecule? Yeah, it's vitter ion. People will also refer to these as amphoteric molecules, meaning they can e either act as an acid or a base, depending on the conditions. And each amino acid has very different P pH, or sorry, pKa's, because these R groups can play a very, very big role in the acidity of not only. Uh, your carboxylic acid, but the acidity of your ammonium ion once it becomes protonated. So the pKa's do matter a lot. If you go into your chart, or in your book, sorry, table 25.2 has a list of pKa's for your carboxylic acids. and ammonium ions. I'm always blown away by how much they differ. Some amino acids um, are very, very basic. Other ones are very, very acidic. It, it really depends on the situation. There is an interesting um, thing I did want to bring up, and this is called the isoelectric point. So isoelectric point is the point at which, or the pH at which the uh, Zwitter ion is in its highest concentration. At its highest concentration. And the calculation for the isoelectric point is actually very straightforward. And this is called PI. That's the isoelectric point. It's the pKa of your carboxylic acid. plus your pKa of your ammonium ion. Divided by two. So you just average the pKa's of those two, and you can figure out the pH at which you have primarily your Zwitter ion. Some people get confused by this, but this is your pH of isoelectric point. The cool thing with this is you can actually separate out amino acids by adjusting pH. So what you can do is change your pH, make sure that one of them is Witter ionic, the other ones will be uh, mostly positive, mostly negative. And then what can you maybe do to separate them if you can change the charge of various molecules? Yeah, electrophoresis. So have you guys done that in biology at all? I think some of you guys have. So it's the idea of applying a current to these molecules, and if you have a negative uh, bias at one end and a positive at the other end, you can actually separate out these amino acids at a particular pH. So this is one way of purifying amino acids and trying to isolate a specific one. So can purify, I'll say amino acids with AA. Electro 
hypoparesis. Um, this isn't the main way people purify amino acids um, anymore, but um, you can still do that. What's another way we could purify amino acids besides gel electrophoresis? We did it in our spinach lab. Yeah, chromatography. Chromatography is um, usually used for separating these compounds, and you can actually get special silica. Um, it's similar to alumina that's designed for amino acids, and you can purify them very, very easily that way. All right, so let's jump into synthesis a little bit. I don't think we'll make it through this whole section, but a lot of it is review. All right, so amino acid synthesis. All right, the first one should look pretty familiar. Hell Volhard Zelinsky. And if you forgot about this, it was from chapter 22.2. And it's a pretty straightforward reaction. We take a carboxylic acid and we want to alpha halogenate it. What reagents do we need in order to do alpha halogenation of a carboxylic acid? Yep, and then acid or water is good enough. So this was one of the ones on our exam that people were struggling with a bit, um, but hopefully we remember it now. The tricky thing with this reaction is you end up scrambling stereochemistry. You don't get an a enantiopure compound. So this is racemic. And then in the next part, what we're going to do is react this with ammonia. So excess ammonia. And what do you think we can do with that bromine? Yeah, we substitute it, right? It's not a great electrophile. It is fairly hindered. But in this case, it's actually beneficial that it is hindered. Why is it beneficial that that electrophile is hindered? It's a slow reaction. So we said normally with amines, if we react them with a primary alkyl halide, we'll get overalkylation. In this case, we can actually stop with one amino group on there. And this is um, what makes this reaction better than um, what we would anticipate. We still have a racemic mixture. The last step we want to do so we don't accidentally kill people is purify it. This is something the book kind of glosses over. <laughs> and once you purify it, you can get one enantiomer out, and you would probably just discard the other enantiomer. This was the old school way of making peptides. It's not commonly used anymore, but it's historically relevant. The problem with this is you immediately limit yourself to at most a 50% yield, assuming you got 100% yield and everything else. Did you mean put an R on the way? Oops, sorry, that should be an NH2. Thank you. All right, we've got one last one I'll show you guys, and then I'll let you enjoy the sunshine. This is a melonic ester variant. All right, this again was from chapter 22. So melonic ester looks like this, but we're going to use a variant of this. And this can just be purchased. We don't have to make this. This is called diethyl. Somebody has to make it. <laughs> it's cheap. Acetamido. There you go. 
All right, so now we've got this starting material, pretty easy, cheap to purchase. What can we do with that alpha position? Deprotonate. Yeah, just deprotonate it. So let's use sodium ethoxide. We want to choose the appropriate base. And then we can alkylate it. I mean, I'm going to abbreviate the acyl group. Okay, so now we've done the alpha alkylation. What's the next step for the malonic ester synthesis? We want to get rid of one side, right? How can we get rid of this whole side? Yeah, decarboxylation with acid and heat. And now when we do this, you can also deprotect your acyl group. So let's highlight everything that's getting popped off in this step. All of those groups get removed during the acid workup. An acyl group is um, let me circle it. An acyl group is this guy. I just abbreviated that as AC. And then in the last step, we purify. So it's a pretty clever variant on our malonic ester synthesis. All right, we'll continue on tomorrow with more synthesis reactions with amino acids and then start, or not tomorrow, Monday. And then we'll get into uh, synthesis of peptides too. All right. Have a good weekend. All right, on Thursday we covered amino acid synthesis, and so far we've only covered racemic syntheses for amino acids. The first one was a variant of the hell volhard zelensky reaction, where we brominate a carboxylic acid in the alpha position, then we can substitute it with an amine, and then we can purify it. So pretty straightforward for that one. The other variant we saw was the malonic ester variant, where you use diethyl acido, acetamidomalonate. <laughs> it's a mouthful. Uh, you deprotonate the alpha proton, alkylate it, and then hydrolyze everything apart in order to get to your amine. And now we have one last racemic synthesis I wanted to cover, and this is called the Strecker synthesis. All right, in the Strecker synthesis, the overall mechanism is pretty straightforward, and then we'll go through it step by step. You'll start with an aldehyde, and then you'll take ammonium chloride and sodium cyanide. Not the most friendly reaction in the world to run, reacting something with cyanide. But when you do this, your cyanide group can add in <coughs> along with your amine and you end up with a cyanohydrin derivative. The next step we can take acid and what do acids do with cyano groups? So, yeah, we can change it to a carboxylic acid, right? So if we have a cyano group, you can convert that cyano group to a carboxylic acid. And if we look at this, it doesn't look like the standard way of drawing an amino acid, but it is an amino acid. So let's take a look at the mechanism. All right, first step. We're going to take our aldehyde and we're going to react this with our acid. So ammonium chloride is a weak acid, right? We've got the ammonium cation in there. And so we can protonate our oxygen. Hey, you guys in the back, 
Can we not have side conversations? It's distracting. And we can protonate that carbonyl. Now we've got a free ammonia molecule in solution. So this can add into our aldehyde, kick up electrons. And we get our ammonium here and our hydrogen down there. Now if we have more ammonia around, what will happen? Yeah, just deprotonate your amine. Oop, shoot. And the next step, we've got more acid around in solution, so I'm going to draw this as just H plus. And we can protonate our alcohol. So this should look very familiar to you guys, right? Looks exactly like our imine formation. All right, so we've converted our aldehyde into our imine. These are all under equilibrium conditions. I'm just shorthanding it with single-headed arrows. The next thing we have is we've got cyanide around in solution. And the cyanide can attack in, kick up electrons. and we get to our final product. Now if we treat this with acid, I'm not going to show all of these steps because it's very steppy, but we can convert that cyano group to a carboxylic acid. So we've essentially added one carbon onto our chain and we've got a protonated amine. It's still important to remember that with the Strecker synthesis that it's still racemic. If you do want to review this um, mechanism, I would recommend looking at section 2113 if you're unfamiliar with uh, acid hydrolysis of uh, nitrile groups. All right, so the one problem with doing all of these is you immediately lose 50% of your product because it's the wrong isomer, right? Yep. Um, so synthesis-wise, Yeah, we could do more chemistry on this. We still have alpha protons on there, and we can do reactions on the nitrogen position. We can do reactions at the carboxylic acid oxygen. But, but you don't need we're going to get into protecting groups, but yeah, it's very protecting group heavy anytime you work with uh, amino acids. All right, so anytime you do these uh, racemic syntheses, you lose 50% of your product. To be perfectly honest, nobody does these anymore. Um, they're not applicable. They're kind of wasteful, and they take um, too much work. So instead, we've got a much, much better route. The easiest route, to be perfectly honest, is nowadays you can order any amino acid you want from a chemical vendor for very, very little money. But this route was kind of the lead-in to those, these manufacturers developing um, enantiopure amino acids. And so what they did was they had an isolated derivative of an amino acid 
that look like this. So essentially the R is a side chain for your amino acid. And what they were looking to do was to do hydrogenation that was enantiopure. And so in order to do this, what they did was they took hydrogen gas, and then they had a chiral catalyst. And so by using a chiral catalyst, the hydrogen could only be delivered to one face of that alkene and not the other face, and they could develop a, a scheme that would only give you an enantiopure an, an product. And then in the second step, we need to pop up that acyl group down here. So how can we remove an acyl group? <sighs> yeah, we need to use acid or base to hydrolyze our amide there. So in this case, I'll just choose base and water. And then in the last step, we want to protonate everything back to its true form. So we'll just do H3O plus. And when you do this, you get a product with your correct mean. And oftentimes, the percent EE is greater than 99%. Let me erase this. Percent EE can be approximately 99% or higher. So you gain exclusive stereochemical control over your product. So the question is, what chiral catalyst is used? It looks pretty funky, so bear with me as I draw it out. And if you remember back to our hydrogenation section, it should look fairly familiar. I'm going to shade these in. These aren't double bonds. And then we've got phosphorus atoms popping off on the inner side of those benzene rings. And then we've got phenyl groups here, here. So this is our ligand that we have. It's called a BINAP ligand. And they react this with a ruthenium catalyst, or sorry, ruthenium metal. And the ruthenium really likes to bond to phosphorus, so it will bond up like that. And then we also have two chlorines on there. So the formal name for this molecule is R. It rotates life, light in the positive direction, so we usually write plus. And then we write RU. Binap. That's for binapful. Those two benzene rings that are fused together are called napful groups. And then Cl2. This is the chiral catalyst that was developed by, um, I think it's Robert Knowles, and he won the Nobel Prize for doing an antioselective hydrogenation in, I believe, the 70s. The weird thing with this molecule is it doesn't look chiral at first glance. But these benzene rings actually can't stay in the same plane. They'll actually be cocked, and that's why I have the sides shaded in like that. And so what you end up with is something called axial chirality. And therefore, due to this chirality, it can only deliver H2 to one face of an alkene. And this completely revolutionized peptide chemistry because all of a sudden it wasn't a pain in the butt to make peptides. You can make these on large scale and then ultimately Chemists don't even make them anymore today. They just order them from a company like Sigma Aldrich, and they'll 